evening to you guys. Well, it is morning here in Hong Kong and it's a lovely, beautiful morning. Uh, I thought we'd do a little bit of a recap because let's look at what's really happening uh, in the world of Neo. We've had a lovely day, which is really fantastic. I'm very pleased about that. Um, it makes it makes it makes the, the, the evening or morning, where, depending on where you are, just a little bit better, doesn't it, when things are up. Um, and of course, we have Tesla to thank for that quite a lot. Uh, Tesla up 6.18% on the day. So I thought we'd have a, have a quick recap of what's going on. There's a couple of news items as well that are worth talking about on, on the NEO front. Uh, and we can look at just how has momentum shifted also from a technical point of view. Uh, what is the chart telling us? Are we going to continue this rally uh, through the end of the week? Are we going to recover our 60 something positions? Well, I certainly hope so, but let's, let's see what is really coming uh, happening here. Uh, Philco, welcome to our YouTube membership. Fantastic to have you uh, on here as well. Thank you very much for your support. Uh, we also have Jack Hoffman, who's just become a member too, uh, which is equally fantastic. Thank you guys uh, for your support. Uh, Wei Bruce Changda, good evening to you. Um, so guys, let's get cracking. We are going to look at, well, there is one bit of news out which I wanted to share with you that Neo Capital, which I've talked about quite a bit before, for those of you who don't know, it's basically the private equity arm of Neo, and they've invested in lots of things, but they have just invested in a Beijing based company that provides autonomous driving solutions for, wait for it, mining vehicles. Um, and they've just a, um, closed a funding round, of this, which was led by Neo Capital and Eight Roads Ventures, a Chinese PE fund. And it basically, uh, is for the development of driverless systems for open pit mines. And um, they have uh, an office in Shanghai and they are exp preparing also to go overseas with that technology. Of course, mining, uh, China is a huge mining country, but of course there are many others. Um, can I increase the volume? Absolutely. Um, is that a little bit better, Philco? Is that a little bit better? Uh, let me know. Otherwise, I'll um, crank it up a little bit more. Here we go. That's probably a little bit loud. Apologies. I think my big thumbs were on the volume measure there. Apologies if I was a little bit soft, Philco. Thanks for letting me know. Uh, nice to have that little new tag next to your name as a new member. Welcome. Um, Eric, uh, good morning, good evening. Fantastic, guys. Thanks for letting me know. I always appreciate if you uh, give me feedback on the sound. It is much easier from your side. Uh, Winston Lock there, good morning to you too. Um, could you summarize what we've missed? Yes, we've only just got started. I was just saying it's obviously been a, a wonderful Neo day from, 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 from that point of view. Um, and I want to look at a couple of things. I want to look at A, um, what's the momentum? How's it changed? Do the technicals show us that we are going to see more of a... Um, of a rally uh, or, or, you know, how much has that changed since yesterday when, when momentum was uh, was still fairly, fairly bleak. Um, Eric here, also good to have you on the chat, guys. Um, and I was just welcoming Philco to our membership, which is fantastic. Thank you very much for your support there. You can see a little goat in the top left corner, I think. Um, uh, so the, 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 there is a bit of news that Neo Capital, who, which is a private equity arm of, of Neo, and um, if you don't know much about that, guys, check out my video. I've done a video on on, on Neo Capital, uh, going through all their main investments, and there are some really, really, very interesting ones. So they have a whole kind of ecosystem around them. Uh, they have just invested in a Beijing company which provides autonomous driving tech for mining vehicles. I think that's quite an interesting one because um, open mines is, is, is probably the one place where we see um, full autonomous driving first because it is, it's a very controlled environment, right? It's actually, uh, from many points of view, a fantastic testing ground and also makes a lot of sense. It's also a fairly dangerous environment. So not having people in there is, I think, a big benefit from a health and safety point of view. So they've just uh, received, um, they raised about 9 million US dollars in, uh, in, in angel round investments in 2018. And uh, now they've just done their A round um, uh, funding, which was co-led by Neo Capital. So I think that's quite an interesting one. Um, this whole um, Neo Capital private equity fund was jointly launched originally by Neo, Sequoia and Hill House Capital. And uh, it has been quite, quite a, I really have very extensive investments. So if you missed out on that uh, background there, uh, we, we should, we should uh, revisit that. Um, so apparently this financing that they've just closed is 15 million US dollars or so, and uh, they are basically going to set up um, a, a trail of transportation fleet for mines in Inner Mongolia, where there's lots of mining. And um, 
I think from Neo point of view, I think it makes a lot of sense. They're gonna get a lot of data, they'll get a lot of insight. Now we're not gonna see Neo cars in mines. I don't think that's very likely in open mines, but I think it, it gives them a, a another step in, another kind of ear to the ground. Uh, and of course, hopefully a, a, pos a positive investment down the road uh, of where autonomous driving is gonna go. So I think that's, that's, a, that's a smart little investment there that, that they have done. Um, there is a little picture of it here. Um, uh, that, that doesn't really show us very much. And and the second piece of news, I don't know if you've seen that this morning, um, you know, you can track um, most imports into the United States that come by container. You can basically track. There is sort of a fairly public record of it. Uh, and they have just shipped at the beginning of April. Um, they've shipped uh, one or two containers. Hang on, they've got shipped, actually they shipped four containers. Uh, no, it's, it doesn't tell us that it's four containers. I've just got the BL numbers here, bill of, bill of lading numbers. But basically, they ship what looks like two electric cars and um, then perhaps um, batteries. I don't know. In terms of weight, it looks like they might have shift, sh sh uh, sent two or three uh, Neo cars to the United States. And you sort of wonder, there, why are they doing that? Are they, are they, uh, is this just for the engineering team in California so they can kind of get a little bit more hands-on with the vehicle? Is that what it's for? Is it for sort of testing? Is it for autonomous driving testing? Is it for a showroom, people are speculating? So you might see a little bit of speculation out there on that, uh, but it is an interesting one that they have shipped. Um, in terms of weight, I've got it here. Actually, I can probably show that to you guys. Let me see. Um, there we go. You can, you can see that, right? Um, let me make that a little bit bigger for you. There we go. You can see that. You can see the weights on them. I mean, the, the bottom two to me look certainly like cars. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure what 55,000 kg would be. Engineer sample electric car. So, um, you know, people declare things uh, with, with the word sample in it. So they, they um, pay less tax typically. Uh, so it could be that they are simply sending things to California because we've seen that hiring spree in California on the sort of uh, research and engineering um, side. So that, that might well be um, that. Is it the ET7 that's shipping over? Well, they haven't, they haven't um, you know, mass produced any yet, obviously. Uh, they obviously have probably built a sample. So is it the sample and they're sending it over to kind of fine tune the engineering of it? It could be, it could well be, it could be other test cars it, or it could just be, you know, an ES8 or something like that. And they want to do some uh, road tests on, on US roads and kind of get the system to start learning, um, you know, what, 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 what is the traffic situation like? What are the road signs and the rules like in the United States? And perhaps that's simply a plan part of the longer term plan to roll out into North America. So um, ET5, Eric H says, um, Possibly. Uh, so we, we, that's kind of a little bit of speculation there, but I think it's, it's, it's worth looking at. So um, as we've got the screen open here, um, okay, hang on, I made it a little bit too small, haven't I? Let me, let me jig this around a little bit so you can see uh, what I am seeing too um, on a sort of optimum level here. There we go. So uh, this is at the moment down here, RSI day by day. And I'm just gonna look also at Williams R, which tends to be a little bit quicker. So you can see here, I don't know if you can see, because you might be on a smaller screen down there. We are super, super close to that 50 point line. And I know I always bang on about the 50 point line, how that is the, the buy signal. Now indicators, as you can see, tend to lag the market a little bit. So one thing you can do, um, not really for long term, but you can, of course, go in a bit shorter in terms of time. So if we go on a four hour basis, then that takes into account the last four hours of trading. And you can see up here, the little green bars become the last four hours of trading were very positive, right? They were, were essentially a, a, a rally or the last four units there. And um, then when we look at that little dot I've put in there, um, have I now covered and obliterated this? No, you can see here, we are pretty much at, uh, yeah, we are at 50.17. So you want to be at 50 or at 49.99, but you are super, super close to that. And if you went in a little bit closer in time, say to two hours, look, there we go. We would have broken through the Williams R. So that is the likely path on a, on a day by day basis, but not, um, it isn't a hundred percent forecast because you're sort of giving, basically giving you a two hour forecast rather than a, a day by day kind of a, a forecast here from a technical point of view. RSI is still a bit sluggish, 
Uh, let's look at one or two others to see what is going on there. Uh, relative volatility that is coming up very, very nicely. This is on a two hour basis, guys. So this is really like sort of day trading type stuff. But we're just trying to get a feel for how much momentum has changed here. And you can see quite a substantial change from where we were uh, yesterday when we were like in, you know, in the doghouse, basically. So um, let's look at one or two more here. Um, well, we can we can put a Fibonacci retracement back on here as well. Um, from that point of view, we are quite nicely. We've crossed uh, above two of the Fibonacci lines again, and we are, uh, uh, you know, obviously above our sort of 50.48 support line here as well. So I think really the one to watch out for is is, is 55 sort of 60. That's kind of our next res real resistance. Uh, that's what we want to get through uh, to uh, to go back to the promised land where everything started with a six um, on a. Um, on a day-by-day -day basis, Fibonacci is still struggling a little bit. That might catch up later during the day. So I'll, I'll do an update on that if, that if that sort of catches up. But I think it gives you also a feeling just of, you know, the, the utility of technicals and that they do tend to lag. So, you know, we still, um, you can trade entirely on technicals and I'm aiming to do that actually. I think we might do a little bit of a test portfolio and, and just sort of trade some small amounts purely blindly and, you know, with 100% faith in, in, in technicals and just see how that does compare to the real world. World. I think that might be quite a fun thing to do. Uh, so I'll, I'll set that up over the next um, couple of days or so. And um, I'll certainly be sharing that, of course, with you guys on, on our Discord um, over there, because I think that'd be a really, really fun thing to do. And that'll sort of, I think uh, we will all learn a bit more about um, technical um, analysis, really. And now our little market bottom indicator here is back to gray. And I think that is, this is on a day basis, that is kind of a, a good signal. Um, so uh, from a from a momentum point of view, we are out of the bottom. Now, um, what's going to happen today? Well, so far, Nasdaq futures are up somewhat, which is positive. And perhaps more importantly, the volatility index is down 7.6%. And the volatility index is essentially an indicator. I mean, I think it's an indicator of a crash, really. Uh, when the numbers are very high, uh, you, you look, let me just show you. I'll do a quick comparison for those of you if you're not familiar with it, I'll um, just put up the, um, let's just put up the NASDAQ, say, uh, in comparison. No, we want an index, uh, NASDAQ 100. That'll, that'll do the trick. And I'll make uh, all of that line so it's a little bit easier to see for everyone. And then let's go back in time a little bit. Right. Um, okay, can you see... You can see what happened here in February, in, in, in February, March, right? When we had our sell-off um, and then we had a recovery. And can you see what happened to the uh, VIX, the volatility index? Uh, that's the blue line up here. Um, the, the, the orange line is the NASDAQ. Uh, so you can basically see you have a crash. And the benefit of the VIX is that if you'd held VIX before and you would have bought that sort of minus 27, uh, that would have then gone up 360%. So had you held 10K, 10,000 US of that, it would have gone up to 36,000 US dollars, uh, which would have been rather nice. And then when it started coming down again, you could have sold it and you could have bought Tesla with it or anything else that had been, you know, hit over the head by this crash. So it's, it's really quite a nice... Um, crash hedge, I would say. It's one of the few things that really utterly moves typically against the market um, in an exaggerated fashion. Um, now, you kind of want to get in on it when it's really, really low. That's the only thing because, uh, you know, you don't want to be buying this um, when it's halfway up because then you sort of miss the point of it being uh, a, a hedge. And where are we at the moment? Is it super low? Um, it, it is and it isn't. But if you said, I would just say, like, we look at it from the beginning of the year here. Um, is that the beginning of the year? Not quite uh, 2021, that's where here. But from the beginning of the year, you can see we had on uh, 28th of January, we had that spike up uh, quite a bit. Uh, and now we are down again here. Uh, but it is still long term, still somewhat up. So um, it, it isn't super cheap at the moment, but it is definitely something. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm intending on, on, on getting my hands on some of this because I've been watching this for some time and I think it's a, it's kind of a, 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 a clever hedge, I, I think. As always, guys, this is, of course, not financial advice. This is straight out of the goat's mouth. Um, if you that makes no sense to you, uh, you need to watch us more. You need to join our channel. Our channel mascot is a goat. So let me go back here to uh, Candles. 
what have I got on here now? Oh, I've, I've, I've got, still got the NASDAQ on here. That's, that's why we end up steering into the world. Um, any estimates on when NEO will make the official entry into the US market? Well, I think we are still a little bit away from that. So what we, what's the news we've got? We had about a month ago or so the news, they're hiring in Shanghai, basically someone to write the business plan for the United States. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to launch next month. Typically, you write a business plan first and you sort of uh, think about it and then you do some testing and that kind of thing. Now, well, they do have quite a presence in the US um, in California from an engineering and software and that kind of point of view. But those guys are not sales guys. There is actually a nice uh, uh, sort of Neo office with uh, some cars in, in, in the entrance and stuff in California. But at the moment, uh, that isn't there yet. Now, them shipping these cars over, I think it's more likely uh, this here that this is for more research and that's just for making the cars better. And I mean, I think that's a, that's, that's a great move. You get, you get sort of uh, US, uh, California, Silicon Valley standard knowledge in there. And I think that's great that they're doing that. Uh, but you know, is that enough of a shipment to sort of start a showroom? Well, perhaps, but uh, I, I kind of, my, my feeling is that this isn't really what this is about. Now these might eventually end up in a showroom, but I think for the moment, they're probably more likely to do some, some testing there and just improving the product. So. We do know that they're launching Oslo this year. We see that Oslo house coming up there and all the hires in Oslo. And those kind of hires in Norway and Europe are very much like, let's sell cars hires because they're, you know, they're hiring engineers for the workshop. They're hiring sales staff. They're hiring someone to manage so uh, Soho house, I was going to say, uh, Neo house uh, and people to, 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 to man and install uh, battery swapping stations, those kind of things. So these are real like operational day-to-day -day hires. Uh, so obviously Europe is first and it makes sense because in, in, um, in Norway, 50% of all cars bought are EVs. They're incredibly open to EVs there from a government point of view also. So uh, that makes a lot of sense. That's basically a testing ground for, for them. So we, I think we're going to see that first and then I, maybe we'll get a bit more news on that sort of halfway through the year on what the plans for the US are. And of course, we keep an eye on that. And I keep my eyes also on LinkedIn and those kind of platforms where they are um, where they are uh, hiring. So I think that gives us kind of an early indicator there on, on, on what their plans are. But at the moment, uh, we haven't got a fixed date on that yet. Uh, Philco, thanks very much for that uh, question. Um, uh, 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 Reverend Funish, are you talking CCIB is earlier to potential investors, many backholders created? Yeah, absolutely. I think CCIB have uh, kind of burned their bridges with retail investors. And you know what? They probably don't care. Um, that's the kind of the uh, the slightly sad sad thing. They can just make money out of uh, institutions. They got the relations, and that's what they've done. They gave them shares at 15 bucks. So if you're holding it at 30, 40, 50, then yeah, that is not a happy situation. Might it recover in the long term? Possibly, but I think it's going to take quite a long time. And certainly, retail investors are not going to want to touch that thing with a barge pole for quite a long time period to come. And I think you want to see a similar thing with all the other. Um, Churchill Capital companies out there. There are another seven or so SPACs out there. So I think um, uh, be wary. Um, but yeah, it, it depends. Uh, Philco says he thinks, still thinks it's a lot, good long-term play, uh, perhaps in the long-term, but I think you're, you're kind of looking some, you're, you're probably going to go through a year or two of, of pain there where, um, where uh, people just don't, people don't sort of forgive and forget these things very easily when they've lost a lot of money. Um, and it makes you kind of suspicious of management, right? I mean, what are they going to do? Are they just going to dilute us out to death and, and keep handing shares to their buddies on Wall Street? Possibly. Um, um, Okay, so Rex Universe is a little bit more uh, bullish on, on CCIV. Do you think it's a healthy correction? Well, it was, of course, it was overvalued for sure. It's just, I think the, the way they, they've actively hyped up the stock, right? They always fed Bloomberg these little snippets over the last couple of days and weeks to kind of keep this hype going. And why, if they have a high stock price, they can then issue shares at a higher level. So they are basically raising finance cheaper and that's why they did it. Um, and I, I, I think it's not a very nice way of doing it. Really, they should just kept their mouth shut or just said, look, we have nothing to say and left it at that. Instead, they kind of fanned the flames of the speculation, which is rather easy to do in the, in the current uh, market segment we are. Um, uh, CP is asking, did I buy Neo and Barber over the past week? I did buy Barber. I didn't buy Neo. Um, I, I've slightly missed this dip now, I fear. I was a little bit uh, cautious on it. Um, I, 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 yeah, but, you know, uh, we, are, we are where we are. And in the long run, five bucks up or down, I think don't really matter. 
but it, it is good to see that we are seeing a recovery here. Uh, two green days in a row, 5.6% up, I think is a very pleasing result. And especially market volatility is down. Um, Nasdaq futures are up. I think that's all looking quite, quite, uh, quite promising here, really. If you look at everything that's up, it really is quite a lot of stuff. Uh, so people are getting a bit more positive. Booking.com, you know, and Marriott. So people are becoming a little bit more bullish on this recovery. And that should lift uh, stocks generally, perhaps more the old world of stocks, but also tech. You got AMD, NVIDIA are up, microchip, um, you know, lots of things are up here. Um, telecoms are up even, you know, who are the losers? Uh, well, Chinese stocks for some, some, some unknown reason. Um, PDD, Baidu are hit over the head for really no particular reason at all. Baba is still down a little bit, not much. And, and Palantir is also down a little bit. So I'm not really sure on, on what basis that is happening, it, to be honest with you. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But then um, in these kind of momentum-driven situations, things don't necessarily uh, always have to make sense. Sundial, end of the day, 15% up. Uh, that's kind of an interesting one. Ehang also recovering. Uh, they're now another 8% up. They're now at 54, but of course, still a long way off the $125. Are we going to see those heights again? I think not for some time, because I, I do think even though that Wolfpack report, in my view, is a load of nonsense they, they made up basically to kind of uh, make, a, make a big profit, uh, it, it, it does linger in the back of other people's heads. And a lot of people didn't read the rebuttal, they just saw the headline and that's what they're going with. And, and perhaps that's also why other Chinese stocks are hurting. So these things do actually hurt the, uh, the, the sector overall. Uh, take a look at GME, says Philco. Sure, gladly. Let's have a quick open here of GME. Uh, that's a stock, isn't it? <laughs> right. Um, wow, up 103%. So there's another attempt there, another rally. Whoops, uh, to... Uh, to uh, get get that get that thing going again, um, quite quite yeah, it, it, interesting that. I mean, this of course it, this is pure speculation. So maybe this is the CCIV money pouring into into GameStop. Uh, th that could be it. Um, I mean, I can show you the moment the momentums, but I think you know what that's going to say, right? That's going to do exactly that because you get such a huge volume buying in. Let's have a quick look at what net volumes were were on that. Um, that was. Uh, 79, 77 million. I think this is perhaps not quite up to date yet. Let's look on this on a shorter time period. No, that's correct. It was just, yeah, last four hours was 528K. So that's probably correct, actually. Um, so the volume actually not as big as I thought. Uh, it's just, it, it's all in. <laughs> uh, that's basically what it is. Uh, 83 million here is the net volume on that day, which compared to what we had before, we had 197 million net volume on the 22nd. So that's net volume, that's just buy-in volume. Um, and um, so we, we were way up in the sort of higher territory. So we had sort of two and a half times volume that we have at the moment, but that's still a very impressive uh, rally there. And the question is, is that just is that just Reddit or is someone else sort of driving that up and hoping to make a buck, push it up and then, and then sell out gradually as that is um, coming down? Um, we've got our little bot going here, guys, but just thanking you for subscribing. Thank you very much, um, um, everybody here. Ida, Dangle, Sanker, Tristan, Robin, Seed, and Matthew. Uh, thank you very much for subscribing. You want me to look at this on an hour-by-hour -hour basis? Uh, there you go. So you can see it just happened really in the last uh, bit of the hour where we went from, what, from 60 up to 90. Uh, so yeah, that's really... That's quite interesting. Um, a, a end of day rally. It takes the opportunity away from others to kind of change their mind, I guess, if you do it right at the end of the day. Um, you can see net volume falling off a little at the end of the day uh, down here, right? You can see that there, but momentum is, 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 is going through the roof here. Um, so uh, that's kind of an interesting one to see. When, when did we last have that kind of uh, high momentum? Probably on the 25th or 5th of January or so, when we were sort of at the beginning of that rally. So yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, what does it really mean, this GameStop stuff? Um, it, it's um, shorts maybe covering, Philco said. It could also be that. It could be shorts having to buy back in and they're doing it at a lower price and therefore pushing it up. Um, a, a very good thought, Philco, absolutely. Um, 
I mean, if it is in shorts, then I think it is just a sort of just sort of overconfidence continued. Um, people are sort of like shrugging off this little bit of a correction we had these last couple of days and are bullish again on uh, on everything and are certainly willing to to gamble. But it could be you are you are right. It could just be shorts covering because it is near the end of the day. Um, and that's kind of a smart time to do it uh, that way. Um, you know, not everybody else is going to jump on the bandwagon, but, you know, they push it up 103 percent. So if you were covering shorts, that was still a pretty expensive and painful motion because you don't want to be doing that. You want to cover your shorts gradually and silently and quietly without moving the market. You don't want to, um, you know, push it up 103 um, percent. Will it affect uh, Palantir like it did last time? Well, I mean, Palantir was on the um, sort of Reddit uh, channel last time. Let's have a quick look at um, yeah, net volumes are pretty low here, very low, actually. 353,000 shares. Uh, that really is nothing in an hour, of course. Now, let's have a look on, on a day basis. Uh, still, volume was um, actually minus 90 million. Um, that is not as bad, though, as the day before. The day before, it was... Um, 145, 183 minus. So fairly sizable volume. They're st still selling off. And momentum not looking very happy. You can see here from the Williams R, it's pointing downwards. Um, we can have a quick look if there is any uh, short interest in here. It's making moves. It's actually falling off, but as a percentage of, um, it, it's still, it's basically at 10%. And I don't know if you guys can see that. Let me magnify that for you. You see, you see that number here, the, the, the green number, the 9 million is the short interest and the 90 million is the volume um, of just the, the general market. So that kind of, that gives you the percentage basically, right? You're at, you're at 10%. Um, if we go back a little bit, uh, it, it's been moving very similarly at around that 10% mark. Uh, we haven't really had a, a strong spike. 27th of January, we basically were at 20% short interest. Um, but since then, the kind of short juice has gone out of PLTR, which I'm rather happy to see because I, as many of you might know, I'm, I'm long uh, Palantir. So <laughs> I, I don't like people shorting it. Don't do it, guys. It's not worth it. So yeah, we're waiting for buy signal on Palantir. Absolutely. I mean, I, I totally agree with you there. I might actually buy a bit more of that too when it, um, it's moving actually quite sort of sideways. Um, I mean, you know, the chart looks rather dramatic. But it is kind of um, not making big moves here these last couple of days. Let me move that up a little bit. Um, it's moving in a fairly narrow band. Um, it's good, though, to see, you know, what I like to see with this kind of thing. You can see the um, our highs and lows are getting smaller. And, and, and I quite like to see that. So, you know, we are, of course, on this, this kind of crazy trajectory here. I mean, okay, this is a very crude uh, line. But you can sort of see uh, that trend. But at the same time... Uh, you have, you know, that moving in that direction. It doesn't really work on a one-day day basis. Uh, I don't think this is going to be a, a sort of particularly useful triangle. But you get the idea that um, maybe I'll actually put in some bands. That might be that might be smarter. Um, uh, duh, 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 duh. Parallel channel. So this is a, a one-day parallel channel, guys. Um, where did it go? Oh. There we go. Uh, can you see what, 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 I'm, what I'm trying to point out is that on the last day, the up, the highs and lows were much, much less than on the previous days. And that's kind of nice to see that sort of a market calming down a little bit and, and sort of crazy uh, buys and sells uh, le leaving the world. That is, of course, not a prediction that's necessarily going to happen again. But, um, I, you know, you kind of want less volatility in, in, in a stock unless you want a beautiful rally. But generally speaking, I think uh, st steady growth is kind of what you're going for here. And to me, that's what Palantir is. I think it's a long term compounding business, I think I think they should do very, very well. And if you want to check out my discounted cash flow model on that, I did a video on that, I think, two days ago. And that um, XLS is also over on our Discord channel, guys. If you want to check that out, you can get there for um, through the, the, the Patreon link below. Uh, Jason Lee here, good morning or good evening to you, depending on where you are. Um, hearing weak months for Feb in China, is it possible to see weak guidance from NIO and the announcement for March 1st? Should be really bad. These day guidance is more important than, these days guidance is more important than results. Um, I'm hoping that we are going to get very, very stellar delivery numbers. I think there's a chance for that. I, I, I'm rather bullish on delivery numbers. I'm a little bit cautious on earnings because I think earnings will be solid, but I think the expectations are 
somewhere you know near the moon and that's a little bit the challenge that if you look at like jp morgan's expectations for example uh, they're basically expecting something like um um, a, a kind of 12% increase uh, of revenue per car sold in, Q, in Q4. And I, I'm struggling a little bit to see where that re additional revenue is going to come from per vehicle sold. So it'd be interesting to see that. But I mean, that, guys, is a big, big item in the calendar. 1st of March, make sure you join us for that live, guys. If you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, do, uh, because that is, uh, is, is is really a key one to listen to. Uh, Philco is hoping for a huge breakout. I think I think I am too, of course, but let's just see here. Um, we can have another quick look at our uh, market bottom. So our market bottom signals here is still calling market bottoms, which is somewhat encouraging, but it also sort of just shows that this indicator struggles a little bit with high, uh, high volatility. Um, and the other thing we can look at, um, oh, where did my little squeeze thing go? I have this little squeeze indicator here. Here we go. Uh, this one, squeeze momentum indicator. I quite like this one. So what this does is, and this is a really funny one. This is kind of an interesting one. Um, we'll go back a little bit here. So when they, when the little crosses here, when they go black, it says it squeezes on. It's got nothing to do with short squeezes. It's a different kind of a squeeze. It's, it's, it's a momentum squeeze. It says it squeezes on. And then when the squeeze gets released, it goes from black to gray. And if at that moment the green, the lines are green above, you get a rally. If they are red, you get a sell-off. And um, it's quite of an interesting one. I quite like watching this. I've been I've been watching this only for a, a couple of weeks now. But if you give if you look at that line here, and I'm going to make that green because that was a green one. Um, where's our green? There we go. Um, and then you see where we where yesterday so basically what this is saying is that when the squeeze releases you should get an explosive move in one direction or the other so certainly on the 22nd of january it gave us that squeeze release and we saw you know we went from what uh, 25 to 32 uh, that was a explosive rally uh, and then the next time it uh, it, it, it has said to us, well, you know, this is going to be a sell-off. It was yesterday. That wasn't so particularly explosive. So it was right on the timing, I suppose, uh, but it, it wasn't very explosive, which is uh, the good news that people are long on this. But yeah, it's an interesting one. I'm, I'm going to keep watching this, guys, and I'll let you know when I see, uh, when this thing sees an explosive motion and, and how that works. Now, with indicators, always you have to be a little bit uh, cautious and you have to sort of understand the wider world of it because uh, they just sort of measure a particular set of statistics and compare it to something and then kind of give you an indicator. So looking at a number of them is important. And as always, guys, this is not financial advice. This is just for entertainment only. So uh, thanks uh, for that. Um, uh, Mike had a great question. What kind of stocks move opposite direction from EVs? Well, it is a very good question. Uh, and it's an interesting question. Well, I would say if you look at the last couple of days, it is basically what we would call defensive stocks, value stocks or um, consumer um, staples. So uh, what do we see moving in the opposite direction the last few days? Well, we saw Facebook, for example, was going up, uh, not yesterday, but the day before when everything was, was cr coming crashing down. Um, and um, basically, I would say stuff that is essential. Uh, that you buy every single day. I gave the example yesterday of you know hair color, something like L'Oreal or something like that, because women will color their hair even in recessions, even if the market crashes. Um, so there are items that you simply can't do without, and it's those. Maybe uh, you know Colgate, Procter and Gamble, those kind of type companies that you kind of can't live without. And um, uh, you know what, what did we see yesterday? Well, yesterday on the S and P, for example, uh, we can see uh, you know what what has is there anything any examples we can see out of this? Um, perhaps not. Well, Colgate Palmolive is here. Um, I, yeah, so I think, I think you can basically look at a, a value portfolio and those things are a bit more defensive. And what gets hit the hardest in a sell-off is the stuff that's gone up the most. And that's basically Nasdaq stocks. That's basically tech stocks. Now, Facebook, for example, I don't think is a tech stock anymore. I think that is a value stock now because they have basically guaranteed income from, from advertising. It's, it's not a tech platform anymore. It's just an advertising platform. That's where all the money comes from. So there are quite a lot of stocks like that. And now the other thing, which isn't technically a stock, uh, but it moves against the market is the VIX here uh, that moves that's a volatility index it measures volatility when you get a lot of volatility um, this thing goes up 
and in a crash, you get massive volatility. We just looked at it in, in March of the chart and it went up about 360% in fe February. So if you'd had, you know, if 10,000 US dollars in that at the top of the crash, you would suddenly have had 36,000 US dollars in VIX. You could have sold it and then you could buy stocks with it that have been beaten. And that's kind of the, the theory with that. So um, that is kind of a nice, nice hedge. And I'll do some coverage on that. I want to do a video on that, actually, guys. I might just put it over on our um, Discord, but because I, I don't think the YouTube algorithm likes VIX for some reason. It's a little bit too techy. Uh, so guys, do, do check that out and do join us over there if you want to. Um, so I think that's kind of an interesting one. Do, of course, always bear in mind, I don't give recommendations. I'm not allowed. I can't give financial advice. I am just uh, ranting my thoughts for entertainment here. Um, uh, Jasper is confident on, on PLTR. How long do you think the $75 will take? Well, I mean, in the moment, it's a little bit difficult. I, I also say, see from the fundamentals, I think we, you know, if we compound us a little bit, uh, we should be on a, a positive trajectory. If you see where we have been, let me just put a trend line in here. Um, you know, if you see the kind of trajectory that we are in, this is a very, very crude trend line. I'm sort of drawing it through the middle without any particular concerns for anything, um, just to give us a, a feel for it. Um, that's a little harder to see, isn't it? We'll make it. Where did all the bright colors go today? That's too bright for you. Um, that sort of pinkish line here. There we go. Um, you know, if you kind of head in that sort of dire direction um, here on, on a day by day basis, um, after the correction, you know, if we move back up down to here, this is at a 40 levels, um, then how long on that trajectory would it take you to get to 75? Well, let's make this a little bit longer. Um, and um, at that range, and this, of course, is a very crude way of looking at it, it could be sort of mid-year. I would, I'm a little bit cautious on it because I do think there is quite a lot of sort of bad sentiment around PLTR for, for political reasons. Some people don't like it. Some people don't want to touch it. We saw Soros sold out for ethical reasons. Uh, and, and that is, is, uh, is, is an interesting one because, uh, uh, you know, the chat is, doesn't mind tanking countries, but he does have issues with big data for some reason. That's fair enough. I mean, everybody has their, their politics and their, their, their beliefs. As you, a lot of you guys know, I, I don't really look at genomics at all because I don't like the animal testing. So uh, I'm happy to ignore a sector so everybody is entitled to too. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, in the long run, that is actually the curve we are on, provided we kind of go back up there. You know, you might say, well, we're going to flatten out a bit. Um, you, you, you might say that this is a, a new uh, path now and, you know, we're now going to live on this one, uh, which is also fine. For me, it's just something to, to, to buy and hold and forget. And um, hopefully in 10 years time, I'll be very happy with what I acquired there. Uh, pump that like button for the goat, says Phil. If you're wondering why he's saying that, uh, let me pull you up a goat. <laughs> um, we donate one cent for every like. Um, I always do it for all our videos. I donate one cent for every like to the gentle barn sanctuaries here. All these lovely fluffy creatures. Look how sweet they look. And uh, the, the goats are our channel mascot. Um, let me find Baron von Goat. Um, I don't know where he's gone. He's down here somewhere. But look, there are so many nice, sweet, fluffy creatures. All you got to do is hit that like button. I donate one cent and it's going to add up very nicely. And we will do that donation in three days. I haven't done the tally yet, but I suspect it'll be um, maybe 500 US dollars plus, something like that. So it's a, it's a, it's a, one cent doesn't sound like a lot, but it does really add up um, over all the videos we do. And as a community, we are growing very nicely. So guys, thank you everybody for uh, for subscribing and, uh, and and supporting and also joining our Patreon and joining our Discord and joining our membership here. Uh, I, I really appreciate that, guys. Um, it, uh, it, it, it basically is what keeps us going here. So um, uh, Jasper, ethical reasons uh, means deciding to take massive profits. Yes, I think that is also my slightly uh, um, cynical interpretation of that move. I, I agree with you. Um, uh, he man, he's arrived late. I'm going to watch the earlier stuff at 1.5 times until I catch up to the live. See you guys soon. Thanks very much, he man. I do that a lot with videos too. I just make it a little bit faster. I try to speak and kind of make things information dense, but you can always make it faster. Um, thanks, thanks there, Jasper. Um, Philco, um, the original mascot was Braveheart indeed. Braveheart has sadly passed away, but we have a, 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 a new goat. We have Baron von Goat. Where is he? Where did Baron von Goat go? Here we go. Uh, this is our current channel mascot, Baron von Goat, also a rather regal looking elder statesman goat here with this snazzy coat. So uh, keep suggest supporting these, these goats, guys. Um, well, Neo Goat is 60 plus in March as Hanif. Um, uh, enjoy your show, Stephen. Uh, smash the like button. Thanks very much, guys. I appreciate your support. Okay, let's have a, have a look at Neo. Let's see where we are in the brave new world of Neo. So 
we were previously always in this blue kind of trajectory of a, of a, of a, of a path. Uh, all these pink lines in here are support lines that we drew in frantically and, and some of them have held um, on the big crash we had put in this 4169 uh, before the day before the crash. If you want to watch that back, guys, uh, the technicals were right on that. I don't take the credit. I think the technicals should take the credit. Uh, but, you know, that was, was our, that's basically what we were saying is that below um, the 50 point line, there was very little. There was only 45. And then there was really only 41 something. And that's exactly what happened. You can see that here with the little th thin lines. And um, now we are, of course, back in the promised land, which is lovely to see. We are on an upwards trajectory. So the question is really, and I think we have to wait a little bit while the market does here, you know, we could find our way back up into the channel. Um, and then I think there is a chance we're gonna gonna continue, um, or, you know, a, a, along the the old sort of route in that kind of trajectory. There is also a chance that a little bit of steam will go out of the EV market because people are a little bit more more cautious. I'm just painting green lines here for any particular reason. Um, I, I can't stop it. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, you know, and, and if that happens, you might see a slower, you might see a sort of a trend line that moves a little bit, you know, more flat kind of in that direction. That's entirely possible. Why? Because we've had such enormous, enormous growth in such a short period of time from the stock here. So uh, you, you do often see these um, trajectories slow off a little bit. Just see for how long we have been on this, uh, this growth path here. It was basically sort of in October when things really kicked off. In October, guys, we were at 21. So we're at 51. Uh, that is a very substantial move. I know we have been higher, but we've been out of the channel here too, at the top side here, you know, here where I'm, I'm, I'm painting and, um, and, and now we are below it. So, you know, that came back down to earth, down back to sort of the mean channel here. So there's a chance we're going to keep, go back to that, in which case, you know, we, we should be uh, by sort of um, second quarter, we should be at a sort of $75 line. Um, but there is a big but there and the big but is Tesla because Tesla, as you have seen the last few days, it really does make the market and when Tesla has a wobble, um, and I'm going to call this a wobble, it's, it's quite a wobble though, isn't it? Uh, then uh, Neo does the same thing. And you can basically see here that the, the, the pattern is incredibly similar um, when, when Tesla moves sideways and Neo does too. So this all depends on Tesla having good numbers still. I do think they'll have good numbers. I think they're going to sell a lot of cars in China. They're going to sell more cars in China than in, in the US in, in Q2, I believe, possibly even in Q1. So, and there's a lot of growth there for them. And I, I also think that, with each Tesla earnings and delivery announcement, you're going to see those China numbers become bigger and bigger and bigger compared to the US and far exceeding the US and exceeding Europe. And I, I, my hope is that will therefore train investors' eyes on the Chinese EV market and that NEO um, and, and Xpeng and Li, etc. might benefit from that somewhat. Uh, because if P US investors see this, this golden stock of Tesla, um, all the future profit, or a very, very large chunk of all the future profits comes from China, well then what other opportunities are there in China? So I think there is a, 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 a positive story to that, that over the next couple of quarters, as we get those numbers in, or even if we just get the delivery numbers in, provided they're break, broken down by country, as we have seen in the past, and I think that will be be a positive. But we are in a high volatility sector at the moment, so um, you know, brace, brace. Somebody shouted yesterday, which is not something that anybody has heard in many years. Um, what are planes? What do they? What do they still do? So. Um, thanks very much, uh, Hassan. Uh, what do you think of THBR? What is THBR? Does that answer your question? I don't uh, follow that one. Um, Thunderbridge Acquisitions. Oh, this is another SPAC. Uh, what are they acquiring? I Sorry, I have not followed this one. Um, SPACs are um, semiconductor, right? Uh, indie semiconductor. I, I, you know, I'm some SPACs are interesting because it sort of becomes such a big speculative move, uh, but it is just that, it's speculative. As long as your pricing stays pretty close to the $10 line, uh, 10, 10 bucks is basically where they are typically valued for the cash. Um, it is perhaps a fair play, it's a fair flutter, it's, it's a gamble, you know, it's like going into the casino. Uh, when you go substantially above that, then I think you are going a little a bit into crazy land and there's a big risk to it, as we've just seen with CCIV. So perhaps actually SPAC, place will be less risk in the future because people will not pour as much money into them because they know they can get burned. So um, maybe the CCIV has done us all a favor in the long run. But yeah, uh, so apologies. I don't know much about Thunder Bridge here. Um, 
Uh, Fox Sound here saying that, you know, GME, AMC are getting huge inf influxes of money. Absolutely. You're, you're completely right there. Uh, we, we, you know, we, were, we pulled up, uh, I guess you guys were mentioning it, we pulled up GME uh, earlier. So we are at the frothy top of a market. And that doesn't mean that market's going to come down anytime soon. Um, you know, listen to Powell yesterday. He's, he's still promising us, uh, you know, millions of handouts, basically. Well, not handouts, but at least he's printing money and that money is going into the market. And... Um, that's what is sustaining this. Same as with AMC. And as long as we have this overconfidence here, and I'm calling it overconfidence because these companies fundamentally, AMC and, and GameStop, do not deserve the valuations that they currently have, right? Um, AMC, 3.4 billion. I mean, you know, really? Um, what, what's the um, GMC market cap at the moment? Uh, sorry. Um, where, where did it go? GameStop, GME rather. Uh, 6.4 billion. I mean, you know, this is this is just it's just gambling, and people are having fun with it. I hope they're making money with it. I just hope that they they don't get burned too much. Um, uh, Raja is hoping for a positive. Uh, I think you're meaning earnings per share. I mean, even the most bullish analysts I've seen are looking at uh, EPS of sort of minus zero. 0.13 or something. A lot of them are still uh, thinking about sort of uh, minus 0.36, minus 0.4, um, but the expectations there of some are very high. So if they can beat, uh, you know, minus 0.1, say, so minus uh, 0.1 in renminbi, then that would be, um, I think, a huge positive. If they could go positive, I, I, Raja, I mean, I'd love to hear that, uh, Raja. Perhaps you have the inside track there. I think that's more likely to come in, in sort of Q4 of this year. Uh, um, do you think analyst Clive is asking will understand the uh, battery as a service and include that in the share price? Look, I think some of them are. I think you have to give credit to, for example, um, JP Morgan. Let me just pull that up for you guys here. My um, my tracker. Where where is it? There we go. Um, you know, some of them are very very bullish. So Morgan Stanley. Sorry, not not JP Morgan. I always mix them up. You know, too many Morgans on Wall Street. Um, they are forecasting for twenty. 20 uh, four year revenues of 16.8 billion RMB and net earnings of uh, 4.4 uh, million. At 16.8 billion RMB, um, let me just show you that, guys, here. So, uh, I at the moment think the average forecast is about 16.3 billion. Now, if you want to go to 16.8 billion on the um, Q4 car sales numbers, I can do that for you up here. So then you have to divide that uh, by our Q4, um, sorry, full year, full year numbers. That gets you to 384,000 RMB per car on average. Um, that's quite difficult to do. That means you have to like get a revenue of more than 400,000 per, per vehicle uh, in, in, in Q4. Otherwise, you're not going to get there because basically, look, this uh, forecast number here is, is for the quarter, right? So I need to add to that another uh, 500, exactly. So um, these are million, right? So 500 million. Uh, and then if I do that, then for Q4, um, uh, we need to add a little bit more, actually. We need to add, hang on, what do I do there? Um, plus, there we go. So you, you then get to here, and it's a little confusing, guys, but you then get to a revenue per car in Q4 of 415,000. The only way you would get to that is through subscription revenue, I think. So if we have incredible subscription revenue and they are essentially multiplying that forward and saying that revenue is actually going to grow because people are going to upgrade batteries, they're going to pay more for it, then perhaps, uh, yes, you might get to that kind of number. But bear in mind that the 100 kilowatt battery out, uh, is, is, is in short supply. They just announced that yesterday. So you are actually not able to upgrade to that at the moment. You have to wait till April. Now, I, I do think these shortages are going to get resolved in, in the long run, but um, for for now, uh, there is a bit of an issue with that. So, um, I, yeah, I, I think that they are very, very bullish um, forecasts. So, we have to wait and see whether they can beat that. Um,
Lots of questions, guys. Here, uh, we did the GME aftermarket. It's about 160 US dollars. Lol. Okay, that's 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 just insane. I mean, that is just it's 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 fun. It's it's if you're in it, it's fun. I, I'm not in it. It's not really my kind of mess. I like to buy things and forget about them. Um, but of course, if you want to flutter, then that is something you can do. And yes, Philco, you are right. I mean, a lot of institutions are in on that uh, too, uh, but they are just in there for the for the short term money too. They don't fundamentally believe in the business. I think Syrian is encouraging us to buy Neo, uh, and Q earnings should be delightful. Says Jackson, good to have you on the chat here. Um, yeah, we took, we looked at, at, at GME just and um, Fox Sound there. Thanks very much for all your questions, guys. So let's do it. Let's do a quick recap here on where we are. We have some actual news out. Um, Neo Capital is invested in a um, a sort of mining autonomous driving company. Uh, Neo Capital is the PE arm, the private equity arm of Neo. They set that up with Sequoia and um, Hill House. And it is an interesting one because everybody's basically saying the first place we're going to get full 100% autonomous driving are open mines because they are enclosed areas uh, and you can basically have, make them safe. You just take the people out. And quite frankly, you don't really want people in mines because it's a blooming dangerous place to be uh, and also a very unhealthy place to be. So uh, all those trucks can drive themselves uh, and they'll probably also be EVs. We have quite a lot of EV mining trucks in China. They use battery swapping because actually it's quite easy to do, right? They only move like, you know, what? A mile or something so you have one battery swapping station there um, but they're carrying very heavy loads so they use a huge amount of uh, power of course so they they, they do battery uh, swapping uh, and, and this particular sort of company they invested in they've just closed their a round financing uh, at about 15 million us and neo was co-leading that financing round um, i think that's a it's, a it's a positive because i think it's good neo gets their hand on that software that technology and also the data because you're going to see a completely pure self-driving and they're first going to roll this out in inner mongolian mines but they are planning to expand internationally this um this is sort of a startup there i think that's kind of an interesting story uh, and the other uh, story that we have is that there are containers shipping to the us full of neo cars um you can see that down here i know it's a little bit small it's a, sort of as big as i can make it uh, but you can see here We've got uh, four builds of ladings, which indicates this is four containers, although not necessarily. You can have more than one bill of lading in a container. And uh, it's basically coming from China and it's going to the US, likely to uh, Neo, California. And uh, certainly the bottom two uh, look like cars. They're described as electric cars. And then you have an engineering sample, which is only 5,000 kg. So we're not quite sure what that is. Maybe that is a, a powertrain or something like that. And then you have a, um, another electric Neo car um, which is only seven and a half thousand kg, sort of half half the size of the previous two. So these are likely, I would say, components or cars for testing uh, by the US staff, because a lot of engineering and development and software staff of Neo are based in uh, in uh, California uh, for the excellent expertise, of course, that California has in Silicon Valley. So I think that's probably all that is. I, I kind of don't think this is like the opening of a showroom. Um, that's not my feeling because we know they've only just hired somebody to to uh, write the US business plans. So this will be a little bit premature, but there are already some Neo cars in California. And, you know, there is a sort of showroom in that office. So it kind of makes sense that they are probably just shipping the latest models, the latest tech, uh, perhaps even the sort of parts of the ET7. And, and they're getting their US guys to uh, help with the, uh, the, the sort of development of that there. So I think that's kind of the news on that. Uh, another bit of EV news is that Volvo Cars and Geely are merging. Um, a little bit of a surprise, well, Geely owns Volvo outright. Uh, they also own 10% of Daimler and, 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 and Lotus and lots of other things. And Polestar is owned by Volvo, uh, but it's an actual merger now. So that's, that's an interesting one. Uh, Volvo Cars and, 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 and Geely are going to actually merge. So that's a bit of a bit of a change there for, for, for that brand. Uh, possibly good for, for Polestar, that EV down the road, uh, that they are a little bit closer to the mothership of Geely, where, of course, all that stuff is going to be made. So um, uh, Stephen says, can you make a case for Neo's market cap to go to 900 billion or is that for the birds? Well, Let's have a quick look at Neo stock here, right? So at the moment we're at 81 billion, right? So you'd need to, um, I think a simplistic way of looking at it is that say this year, say people are expecting 100,000 deliveries this year, right? And we are at, you know, whatever price we're at, we're at uh, 50 something US dollars. Um, so if that doubles, 
each time it doubles, you assume the market cap doubles with it. Um, now, that is a really, really simplistic way of looking at it because you're ignoring revenues, uh, you're ignoring, sorry, you're ignoring earnings margins, you're ignoring future growth. And, and NEO is valued at future growth. We're looking at future earnings, you know, 2023, 2024, 2025. That's what we're looking with EV stocks, generally speaking. So it's a little bit of a simplistic way of looking at it, but you could do that. Say we have 100,000 cars this year, um, then, you know, that takes our market cap if it doubles next year, uh, it takes our market cap to 160 billion. Say we double again then to 400,000 cars, and then say that doubles our market cap again, then you add 300 billion. If you then double from 400 to 800, uh, then you know you are at, uh, where were we? <laughs> um, so we were at um, 648 uh, billion there. Um, you can kind of sort of see that. Now, uh, after sort of 800,000 cars or so sold, you need to look really at, internationally speaking, you need to look at Europe and the US at growing at that same trajectory. Um, but you can kind of see how you could get there, but you will only get there if in 2025 people will think, this is just the beginning. Um, they are going to make so much more money in the future, going to sell so many more cars, the revenue from subscriptions, etc., is going to be so much bigger. So you, you need to believe that this positive story we are on doesn't end in 2025, but that's just the beginning. Now, when we look at the Chinese numbers, by 2025, uh, China will buy about 7 million EVs per year. That'll be about 35% of all EVs sold. Now, that number, of course, could go from 35% to 100% if EVs really are the, the long-term future. So you do still have a lot of growth there, there in that potentially. Um, and then, of course, you could then apply that to the whole world. But it kind of then depends really on how bullish you are on the EV sector overall and how much um, the car sector will change. Do you think it'll all become fully autonomous? Do you think we'll no longer own cars? Do you think we'll just get driven around by fully autonomous cars? And therefore, uh, these companies like NEO will own fleets and, and sort of run them and get subscription revenue from that on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, which could be could make valuations more appealing because then, then you become a, a subscription tech business with that kind of multiple and you're no longer a car business. Not that NEO is valued like a car business, it's basically valued like a tech business. So uh, I hope that is a, a, a thought you can you can think on. Um, what Fox Sound is infuriated that all the EV stocks follow Tesla. Well, yeah, that is kind of the reality we're in. Why? Because Tesla made the market. Tesla basically created the EV market single-handedly. So when Tesla moves, uh, NEO moves and everything else with it um, up and down, basically, they can diverge a little bit over time. But uh, essentially, uh, that's what's happened. Um, you know, if you just pull up here, uh, NEO again. Um, NEO is the orange chart here for change and the, and, the, and the colorful one. Actually, let me make that a line too. It's easier to see. Then the blue one is, uh, is Tesla. The orange one is NEO. If you go back over time, um, you can, of course, have more growth on one or the other. This is um, the orange one, NEO kind of catching up there, that big rally that we've enjoyed. And there are periods where they are moving in opposite directions, um, but not, I mean, overall, I think you can see even just from that, the correlation is pretty strong. Uh, there are periods here in, in November, uh, early December, when um, when NEO, uh, here, this period here, which probably deserves a red color, uh, that NEO went down and, and, and Tesla was going up. But that is perhaps a simply a correction of the kind of um, overbuying into NEO at that particular point in time. And then uh, once we sort of got back down to kind of Tesla levels, you know, we, we are continued up and down. And you can see really, that's really what's happening here. Uh, you can have exaggerated move movements by one or the other, but generally speaking, it, it does pull. Um, Tesla basically makes the market. I think that's a fair thing to say. Um, I hope Neo dips hard so again so we can load the boat even more, says Jordi. Okay, that's a, that's the spirit. Um, perhaps not for those of us on the call who are long Neo, but uh, I see what you mean. In, in in the long run, I mean, these things are opportunities if you have that kind of uh, risk appetite and you have cash lying around. Um, uh, do I, Nicole, do I think, always think Tesla will control the EV market, say, in five to ten years out? I think it will lessen over time. Uh, but yes, at the moment, yes. Why? Because they simply sell a lot more EVs than everybody else. They're seen as the industry leader. They are the one brand people talk about. If people hold one EV stock, they will definitely hold Tesla, I would say. Um, so it is It is just the one that makes the market. It's kind of a, a one stock index, if you will. So that will lessen over time. 
uh, once we have a lot more EV players out there and once we have a lot of the traditional car companies moving full EV, then that will no longer be such an enormous factor. But uh, did you see that Daimler announcement? They're planning on um, phasing out uh, ICEs by 2039. And they just announced they might do it a little bit earlier, uh, but they're not quite sure yet. So, I mean, that gives you the kind of uh, snail-like pace that the ICE companies are on. They're just struggling with this because basically they sell an EV, they lose money compared to selling an ICE. So they just know if we do this quickly, our margins are going to look horrific. If we do this slowly, we fall behind. So they are kind of between a rock and a hard place. We also see Volkswagen selling a lot of cars to their dealerships to get their EV sales numbers up, which uh, I think is not something that builds confidence, especially when you are VW and you have a little bit of a confidence issue. Uh, um, anyway, um, Adam is asking about CCIV. I think I, my feeling is the steam's out of that. Um, I think, um, let me remove Neo here. I think the confidence has gone out of that because basically management has shafted um, retail investors here and people tend not to forget that for quite some time. So I would expect in all the Churchill Capital, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight SPACs, we're going to see a lot less retail money moving in there, a lot of less speculation. Uh, we are um, down, um, you know, 18 and a half percent yesterday, which isn't a huge move by by CCIV standards, but uh, you can see that it, it isn't fun for everybody who bought uh, you know, uh, all, all the way up there, sort of above 40 or so. Uh, this was a fairly painful experience, I think. Um, Sal there, you call it a, a fraud. Yeah, well, it is It is just, you know, Wall Street is able to screw the retail investors. And I think they did because they were encouraging, they were flaming this speculation by putting out these sort of uh, two people familiar with the matter said stories to feeding Bloomberg with that every day. And of course, they're feeding that. This is all done intentionally to inflate the stock price so that they can issue shares to their institutional bodies at a higher price. And therefore, they get more money for those shares, less dilution is better for them in the long run. Uh, but they don't give a give a give a damn about um, their, their, their retail investors. They just don't care. That is just not part of what they do. They just make money with their you know wall street buddies basically so that's that's the way it works and um yeah hopefully quite a lot of people have made money out of this but i'm, I'm sure some people got burned rather badly too so uh, i i'm sorry to see that um why is barber going down will uh, that's a very good question you know what i i cannot think of a single reason um we've had excellent numbers over chinese new year better than than ever pretty much uh 52 percent of all Retail spend in China now is is online. So 52 cents out of every dollar spent on all retail in China is spent through e-commerce platforms. Um, in the US, that is now 15 cents per dollar, um, and, and and that's high but for US standards. So China, they're light years ahead, I would say. I think they have they gave us great numbers. I'm excited about the cloud business. They're ramping up their subscription, which is a sort of prime, um, Amazon Prime style business, which is A, good revenue, and B, it gives you that moat. It gives you the, um, it blocks people into your, uh, your ecosystem. We have, you know, have lots of exciting news out there for the, from their entering into in the EV sector. They're powering, uh, their software is powering lots of, um, you know, EVs that are built by SAIC and BASC and the state owned -on companies, etc. Um, I, I don't think there's any particular reason because, you know, down 1%, it's not sort of it's getting punished for any particular government announcement or something like that. We are coming to the end of the tunnel of the ant issue. We have got basically two out of the five issues solved. We're waiting for the other three. And I think once those are solved and once ant is um, able to basically give us a new draft prospectus for the next listing, likely at a much lower valuation. I think that's when when Alibaba is is going to be set free again because the 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 fundamental valuation on that I think is just um, it's uh, it's 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 very very good. Let me see if I can pull that up for you here. Uh, Finbox. Um, uh, but yeah, basically, if you look at yesterday, what, what what got punished for the second day in a row? But it's basically Chinese stocks. So people are perhaps in the US still um, rather cautious on uh, Chinese stocks. And when things go a little bit wobbly, uh, that is the one thing that they sell off quite quickly. So here's Amazon, uh, so Alibaba, 27.5x uh, PE ratio. Uh, you can see that here, right? Uh, Amazon is at 75 pretty much. eBay is at 15, but that is a, it, it's a good business, but it's a really fairly moribund business. It is not investing, are they? Um, so 
it doesn't really make sense. And why doesn't it make sense to me? Because Alibaba's margins are four times or five times higher than Amazon's. Why? Because it's a platform. They don't hold any inventory. So it is a much more profitable business than Amazon is. And the cloud business doesn't really factor into Baba's earnings yet because that we've only just had the first quarter where it was slightly profitable. So that is going to explode in, in my view. And as always, guys, this is not financial advice. This is straight from the goat's mouth, our channel mascot. If you want to support him, click the like button. I donate one sent to him and his goat buddies at the Gentle Barn Sanctuary. So um, I, I do think the valuations are very, very low there. And, and, and um, I, I keep buying Barber. I mean, I keep, keep telling you guys, uh, I also always post it on our Discord channel when I, when I buy um, and, and what I'm buying at. And um, for me, it's just a long-term thing. I think for me, it is actually a defensive stock, uh, though um, not everybody realizes that. And that's a bit of a challenge with it. There are, of course, risks to everything. So, um, guys, yeah, if you, if you want to see what I what I buy when I buy, uh, join our Discord, guys. You can do that through the Patreon link below. Um, I also appreciate everybody, of course, who hit that subscribe button here. Quite a few have just done that. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, Marcelo there, good morning, uh, Felix. Good morning to you too, depending on where you are. Um, this could be the reason why Baba is down, says Wayne Tan. Uh, oh, the, the Hong Kong trading tax law. Oh, that, that's, I mean, that's a really tiny one. Hong Kong has a, a, a stamp duty on tax, like, like everywhere. Um, I think it's moved from, what was it, 0.1% to 0. Point, what was the, hang on, Hong Kong. Uh, stamp duty on shares. The, the, the budget just announced that, um, but it's a teeny, teeny, tiny amount. Uh, let's open that here, for, see if Fortune uh, tells us. So it's gone, look, um, the every time you buy a share anywhere in the world, every government has a stamp duty on it. And um, that is being raised from 0.1% to 0.13%. So there's a teeny tiny increase in your trading costs, but actually trading costs in Hong Kong are very low. Banks in Hong Kong actually charge very low fees for everything. Um, so if you were looking for a bank account and you can get one in Hong Kong, I think it's, it's, it's a good place to do your banking. Uh, they also are very, very good on, on currency exchange and all these kind of things. Much, much lower fees than, than, than Europe, for sure. Absolute fraction of it. So does that really make a difference? Does it make a difference for Baba? I, I, I don't think so. I mean, the Hong Kong market, generally speaking, and that obviously has something to do with it, uh, was um, down uh, where our Asian here, um, Hang Seng. No, hang on. We wanted to look at Hong Kong. Uh, yeah, basically Hong Kong is it was 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 um. Okay, this is the market today. See, Hong Kong is recovering quite nicely um, following the U.S.'s lead. They're up one point two percent. Who is up? Let's have a quick look. Uh, let's see if we can find um, who is up here. Uh, so, a lot of the old world is up. A lot of infrastructure, a lot of land, property, banking is up. Um, Tencent is up here somewhat, 1.7%. Uh, Xiaomi is still down. Alibaba is still down some more, minus 1%. Meituan is still down. It seems the platforms are kind of getting getting killed. I really can't see why, because the numbers are good. Uh, but it is a funnily sentiment-driven world that we live in. Um, but what's up most is the kind of um, old world stocks here. People are going back into uh, infrastructure, telecoms, property, um, banking. Um, so people are kind of moving money perhaps into what they see as more safer stocks. And Alibaba doesn't seem to factor into that into people's conclusions, although I think it is. It's highly profitable. It's got 72 billion in cash, a huge uh, positive, pop, uh, positive cash flow, flow um, free cash flow. So, but you know, markets are pickled. So that's, that's where we are. Um, Jerry is basically positive here on the BAAS. Thanks for sharing that. Sal is out of CCAV. You think it's going to go down to 20 very soon? I think it might well go down to 20. It might even hit a little bit lower than that. Um, Jerry is basically in on Neo on the long run. Thanks for sharing that, guys. Dixon, oh, thanks for sharing. You were faster than me with the news. I wasn't quite sure what the number was there on the Hong Kong stamp duty. I mean, does that put me off buying stocks in Hong Kong? Am I going to buy it in New York? No, probably not. What's the, what's the stamp duty in New York? Let's have a look. Um, does that tell us anywhere? No. Does anybody know what, what's the stamp duty? What's the, that's the tax, um, stock tax. 
Google must know, surely. There must be a tax, right? Isn't there? Does New York not have one? Not all countries charge stamp duty, says Dixon. Okay. I mean, there are, of course, also exchange fees. So I, I have not done a comparison on, on, on that. The, the amount is relatively small. I mean, if you're paying a 0.13%, um, does that really matter? Say you buy, um, say you buy 10,000 uh, 10, US dollars or Hong Kong dollars in this case times point um, oh, oh. Hang on. Um, that's difficult to do, isn't it? Point oh one three. Okay, let's do this. Let's do it on a spreadsheet, guys. Too many zeros to do in my head. Point oh one three percent times ten thousand. That is one dollar thirty. So uh, you've gone from one dollar to one dollar thirty on a ten thousand US dollar transaction. Is that is that going to make you run somewhere else? Thirty cents? I think fairly unlikely. Unless perhaps you are a super high frequency trader who trades 50,000 times a day, then perhaps it adds up. Um, but uh, otherwise, I think people are not really going to be affected by that. Uh, Dixon, thank you there for the zeros. You are faster than me. That's why I, I like a spreadsheet. It, it, it just makes it easy. I don't need to think as much. Um, uh, Dixon did the release New York Stock Exchange and also the Singapore Exchange doesn't charge stamp duty. Okay, interesting. Um, I mean, perhaps in the long run, might that encourage some companies to list somewhere here or there? Uh, but really, do, you can't, do, do stocks, do companies want to be traded at high frequency? I think probably not. Um, right, oh, Dixon, thanks very much. Uh, they could get it from spread and fee on gain is 55% in California. Uh, runner there. Okay, yeah, I mean, the, the taxes, the good, the advantage of Hong Kong is we have, um, we have no dividend tax, we have no capital gains tax, right? So you can trade your stocks as much as you want, all the money is yours, basically. There's no income tax on uh, profits from stocks either. So uh, it, it is a very tax-friendly environment, generally speaking. It is putting that out there on a the little bit. Why? Because volumes on the New York, on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange are exploding and the government is, uh, well, in a deficit for the first time. They have a big pile of cash they're sitting on but uh, they don't like to sort of enter into a structural deficit. And, and that's kind of where we're going because the government's spending more on sort of social welfare type stuff. And uh, for, of course, for some people that isn't enough, but Hong Kong is not traditionally a welfare state. And um, a lot of expenditure that they've done in the last year, of course, on COVID, a lot of sort of bailouts have been giving us money and, and they're kind of phasing that out. And they're raising a little bit of money here through stocks. So, um, does the GME squeeze affect NEO, says Joey there? I, I kind of think not. I, I don't think um, this is just kind of froth again. Uh, people are piling into that. The only way it affects all stocks is that when these things happen, when you see stocks going up 160% in a couple of hours, uh, some investors will then think, we're at the top of a market. I'm going to move my portfolio into safer havens because I'm worried about this being too much, possibly the peak of the market. And that's a little bit the, the problem, I think, with the whole uh, GameStop stuff is that it is such confidence that people can think that this is overconfidence and overconfidence is what you see at the top of a market. So it makes people more cautious. And that's why we've seen volumes fall off, right? We saw that on, on NEO and all stocks um, the last couple of weeks, really, just volumes were a little bit less every day. And therefore, um, stocks tend to trend downwards. Um, so Alan Mang is here sh sharing with us some fees. So the fees rounded up to the nearest penny. It's, uh, so it's, it's very low. Okay, I, I, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, FINRA fees, okay. Um, so guys, yeah. So yeah, guys, let's do a very quick roundup really on where we are. Um, we, um, well, obviously we've had a good day thanks to, to really Tesla uh, leading the market back up here. Uh, momentum indicators are a lot more positive. They're sort of nearing buy signals, not quite there yet on a day by day basis, but on a shorter sort of hour by hour basis, they certainly are in a, in a buy field. Bear in mind, guys, so I don't give financial advice. I'm just here to entertain, um, and our goats are important. So hit that like button, guys, and also join us on our channel. Join us on our Discord if you want to talk to uh, me and the community 24-7. Uh, we can do that on, over on our Discord. Um, the other news we have is that Neo Capital has invested in an um, um, A round uh, financing for a autonomous driving software company for mining vehicles in China. I think that's quite an interesting one. We also saw that uh, NIO has shipped uh, what looks like um, two or three containers of cars and components to the US. Uh, now, my speculation there is that that is for the California team to um, develop and, 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 and sort of build out. 
uh, the, the the new tech that Neo has. Possibly there are ET7 components in there too, um, and, and looks like there are two fully fledged cars on there. So that's kind of I think an interesting one there. To me, that doesn't look like a showroom yet. I think we're not quite there yet on the US. Um, I think we're going to have to wait for uh, for Norway Europe first, which is coming very very soon. I believe I think in the next couple of months we're going to see that open there. Um, and then generally speaking in, in the wider world, um, Geely and Volvo are, are finally merging for good. Um, Geely, of course, already owns Volvo, but they are actually merging into one company. That's kind of an interesting uh, story there because that has to have a big EV play. Uh, Geely, of course, now being speculated as being the potential Apple uh, car manufacturer, which um, I think out of all the, 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 the speculation we had around Apple, to me, that seems like the most likely one uh, because they are used to making cars for others. That's kind of the, the mindset is there, not that of an old ICE manufacturer, although they do make the whole range from ICE to all the hybrid types to full EVs. They make all of it. And of course, they make Polestar, which is a very, very nice car. Uh, so they have certainly the capacity to make something that I think would please Apple. So guys, um, uh, that's kind of the roundup here. I just wanted to do a quick uh, recap, um, I think, of where we're going to go. It, it looks much more positive. NASDAQ um, futures are basically at zero. Okay, they're dipping here into just slight negative territory, but they're pretty much uh, giving us a much more positive story than the last few days. The volatility index is down. That is a good sign. That is, is sort of uh, market confidence back there. Um, and um, uh, Reverend Re 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 Fanny Shu here speculating the neo cars could be for U YouTube. Um, uh, reviewers, it could be, it could well be also that they that they might use them for for journalists, for the big car magazines, the big car TV shows to do tests. Uh, we've certainly seen quite a lot of that in, in Europe and in the UK. Uh, there are a lot of those tests. So yeah, that is, is a possibility. Uh, uh, funny shoe there. Thanks very much for that thought. Um, um, guys, I, I appreciate all your support. Uh, we are above 12,000 subscribers. Thanks to you guys. So thank you for everybody who hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and also for all the guys who've joined our membership and have joined us on uh, our Discord channel um, where I share more information during the day. And I'll keep doing that, especially today, of course. It is a lovely morning here in Hong Kong. I'm up in the clouds at the moment. Um, I thank you guys for tuning in and we'll be back uh, later in the day. Uh, it is Lee Auto's um, live earnings call in about, uh, I would say, 10 hours. So make sure you join us for that, guys. And for that, you have to be subscribed. Otherwise, you miss that announcement. Uh, that is basically a preview, I would say, into what uh, NEO might do because these guys are in the same market in very, very similar conditions. So join us for that and uh, see you very